Thank you, Bo. I'm a researcher here at the Northern Institute. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the Larrakia people. Uh, we're very pleased to be able to present the seminar here on the traditional lands of the Larrakia people and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we welcome our speakers today. So we'll have John Mansfield, who is, uh, he is a, um, a lecturer in linguistics at the University of Melbourne and also an honorary research fellow here at the Northern Institute. And his colleague, Margaret Perjert, who is one of the elders that does part of the visiting program in prisons, which we'll hear more about in a moment. And also Jeremiah, who's from Wad Air, um, with us as well. Uh, this seminar is presented by the Northern Institute, also with the support of the Top End Linguistic Circle, which is a group that meets irregularly throughout the year to uh, discuss linguistic issues, and also the North Australian Research Unit, who um, is also supporting us today. So we'll have a presentation for about 30 minutes or so. There'll be time for questions afterwards. Uh, sorry for people online that you can't ask questions during the presentation. Um, but I think John might be available and Margaret will stay around afterwards to answer any questions at the end. So, thank you very much, John and Margaret. Thanks, Cathy. All right, so I'm John Mansfield. As uh, Cathy mentioned, also here with my colleagues, Margaret Perjet and Jeremiah Tunmuck. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk a bit about Aboriginal languages in prison. And I'm really happy to see there are lots of people here today who work in the area and have expertise in the area. There's lots of people here who actually know more about this than I do. So I'm be very glad for those people to um, have input, to ask questions, to make comments, even to um, point it out if I get something completely wrong. This is kind of new to me, this stuff. So, yeah. Um, what we're going to talk about, I'll start, um, I'm going to start just by saying about who I am and how I got to, got to this point. Then we're going to talk a bit about um, law and order, and for, especially with regards to young men in Wadia. And we'll introduce the outlines of the NT prison system. And then we're going to talk a bit about this uh, Murumpata language trial program, which we've been doing at the moment. Um, we'll emphasize some stuff about uh, giving inmates access to traditional knowledge and uh, heavy old language and we'll talk a little bit about some challenges ahead. So uh, as Kathy mentioned I'm a linguist and I first went to Wadia in 2010 to start a PhD in linguistics. So I went to Wadia to study the Murumpata language and I spent a reasonable amount of time in the community and uh, learned a lot about the language and learned to speak a bit. Um, I also uh, got to know, so I did most of my research with um, young men, uh, mostly like just guys sort of around my own age at the time. And uh, they taught me a lot of language and they were very enthusiastic about me learning it. And I also got to know them pretty well and became friends and kind of like adoptive brother with various people. And through all this, a thing I always started to find really striking was how much uh, they went in and out of prison and strangely how normal it seemed for people to go to prison. So I might be working with someone one time and then go back to Canberra or Melbourne for a bit and then come back a couple months later and then happen multiple times that the person I was working with would then have just kind of gone into prison again and then next time they might be out again. And um, it was obviously uh, a real barrier and a real bad thing in people's lives but as I said, also strangely normal. Um, just it didn't obviously didn't have the same sense as maybe it does for um, non-indigenous people in other places because it was just so kind of almost standard. So all this was a bit strange and disturbing. And um, over the years, I was just thinking about it more and started wondering if there's any way I can use uh, my learning what I've learned about the language and the relationships I've built with some Murumpata speakers, if there's any way I could then use that to try and um, contribute something in this area. So what we've ended up doing is this language program I'm going to talk about, which is, is not a research project, it's a uh, more like a community outreach kind of activity, um, and I've been kind of consulting with the uh, NT Corrections Indigenous team on this program. So. Uh, Margaret's going to talk a bit now about uh, young men in Wadia and um, some of the issues to do with imprisonment and how maybe they should be living. 
Um, thank you for coming. And I, I would like to speak on behalf of my young people should have a job instead of prison. Job problem on release. Because like at all at what air, I would like young people to get a better job. Instead of coming to prison, it's not their home. Back home, it's really important for us. So young people like what air in prison. And this is what, they, what they're doing at home, back in what air. Getting a young people to be step on it, to be, to be a better student, a better young person. And for myself standing up here, you know, when I go to the prison, see all these young people, it makes me sad for me and the other back home at what air. Now this is um, the young people, although like, like these other people standing up here, teaching young people to step on a new, like a future coming up for them. It's really important for us, for our people. And it's really sad, you know, when people, young person not there, watching other people doing the job. So I know, I know back home at what age it's so important for us. And for the future, when other pass away, it's really important for us to get a job like this. And a lot of people missing like ceremonies, culture. It's really sad for us young people like what a person in prison. A lot of young people in prison, it's really sad for us. Thank you. Uh, so uh, here's a few things about the NT prison system. Um, so the main adult prisons are, I think the biggest one is Darwin and the other main adult prison is near Alice Springs. So the big Darwin one that used to be at Berrima and is now since a few years ago a new one out near Howard Springs. This Darwin Howard Springs prison has I think about a thousand inmates. Um, so prison people don't just sit around doing nothing all the time it's actually People do things in there, and it's actually a good opportunity in some ways. So people have activity programs while they're in prison. Uh, for example, there are activity programs, I think, where they learn about drugs and alcohol. Uh, I've seen a little bit of an activity program where they're learning about emotions. So it's actually an opportunity to do something constructive and something positive. Um, here's a nice photo of the new prison at Howard Springs, thanks to ABC News. Um, so there's about a thousand inmates here and of those thousand inmates I saw a couple of different stats after this I saw an 80% stat but let's say it's somewhere between like 80 or 90% of inmates are indigenous so hugely overrepresented I know this is not news to anyone here but it's just worth reinforcing and of that very large number of indigenous people who are sadly in this prison um, quite a large number as their first language speak an Aboriginal language. So English for them is a second language or in some cases maybe they don't speak that much English. Their first language they mainly speak is an Aboriginal language. I would guess maybe like half the Indigenous prisoners or maybe more than half, I'm not sure. Um, so there's a lot of people in there speaking Indigenous languages. Some languages which have quite a few people in there, uh, there's a lot of Murumpata speakers from Wadia. There's quite a few Yolngu speakers, just that's a very big group. There's plenty of Barada speakers, there's a bunch of Tiwi speakers. I think there's some Walbury speakers in Darwin prison. There's lots of Creole speakers. So there's like probably five, six, seven languages for which there's substantial prison population. Um, I believe the Murumpata speakers from Wadia sometimes can be up to as many as 100, 100 people in there at once. So. The NT Corrections Department has an Aboriginal strategy team, or they may be called Indigenous Engagement Team, something like that. There's an Aboriginal strategy team whose job is 
to work on programs to try and tackle this issue. And so it was with the Aboriginal strategy team that we started discussions since about 18 months ago about um, whether we can use language as a way of doing something good for these guys in the prison. Now, what they already have going, one of the mainstays of the Indigenous strategy is the Elders Visiting Program. And Margaret has been uh, working on the Elders Visiting Program for some years, and so she's now going to tell you a little bit more about what they do for that. I work for the Elders Visiting Program, and when I go to the prison, visit those young boys from what they like when they see me inside their heart they felt like spirit inside them and i know a lot of young boys in prison feel really sad about it you know like family pass away back home and like our uh, eyes secret it's really hard for them to get out the prisoners back to home for the funeral it's really hard for them and for myself standing up here, when I see all those prisoners from what it's making sad, you know, why, why can't they go back home teaching their young kids, going out hunting, fishing? They're missing a lot in prison. And, you know, when I go in prison and just tell them, this is not your home, your home back in what it, that's where you belong and for themselves if and the, for themselves it feel really sad inside them deep inside their heart i know it's really hard for them you know like other prisoners young boys going in and out from what from home back to prison and it's really sad for your young people like that they should be working like the our elders pass away, they should be stepping on it for the future, for the young future and for the kids' future for coming up. Thank you. And there's a picture of a lot of the elders. Um, so the elders visiting program, I forgot to mention, there's about 15 different communities connected with some of those languages I mentioned. There's about 15 different communities that ha do these visits. So this is a really good established practice that's already been going for over a decade. And it's from kind of from the Elders Visiting Program that gives us a base for trying to develop this language program that we've been trialing. Um, so over the last few weeks, we've been trialing, uh, I mentioned before about prison activities, right? So I, I think some of them are probably very good, but one thing that's missing from a lot of them is people using their own language. Because one of the ideas is that language is strength. We've heard a lot about what a sad place it can be for people in prison, how much they're missing out on. You can just imagine the kind of outlook and the mental state that people can be in, especially when they're going in and out again and again. I think that must be really hard. Language is something that they've got, that they know about, that they have mastery over, and something where they can even be like the teacher and the expert, right? If I'm in the room and these guys speak fluent and I speak a little, right? So they can be teaching me. So one of the key ideas is that doing something in people's language. So a, a question people often ask about the program is, what are you going to teach them? Maybe there is some stuff that we're going to teach them, but actually the first idea wasn't about teaching them something as such, but rather putting them in a position where they can start to feel good about themselves, build confidence and self-esteem. Because maybe they get used to the idea that they don't know anything and that they're not useful people in the world, but actually they know something really amazing. Because if you, anyone who's looked into the Murumpata language, for example, it's like mind-blowing, really. So the fact that these guys can just speak that is, is pretty incredible. So we've been doing a one-month trial program in Murumpata. There's also been a, a few sessions going on in Tiwi, um, thanks to uh, Pirawangi, a uh, Tiwi elder. And what it's based around is, um, well, it's quite exploratory. 
So we've been kind of seeing what works. Eight sessions over four weeks, so twice a week, and ten inmates um, participate. Uh, when we put out the kind of offer, it was oversubscribed, and about like almost everyone in the room at the Elders Visiting Session said they wanted to do it. And somehow that was filtered down to 10 people. Um, so they have an iPad, and that's the base for a lot of their activities. Um, it's just locked down to one app only, which is called Book Creator. I think it's quite widely used in schools now. And Book Creator, it just has a plus thing. And using the plus, you then get a choice of you can add pictures, you can add, uh, you can use a pen, um, you can see here someone's done some writing with a pen. You can put typing in text. And beautifully, you can just, as easy as that, add in voice. And I'm now recording this. And I've just added a recording to it as well. So that was really key for me going into it, because I was aware that a lot of the guys, their literacy in Murumpata would be very limited. And that idea of putting them in a position of strength, I didn't want them to have a big barrier stopping them from getting started. So if they can just speak and put language into the app like that, then they're not being held back by that. As we say in a moment, I had some wrong preconceptions there, though. So what we've been doing is um, a mixture of uh, some of the ideas have been around um, teaching people murumpata. In some ways, that hasn't caught on that well. but because people weren't that interested in doing basic, easy words. We also have done a bit of talking about um, traditional knowledge and old words. So there might be an example here. So this one's put in a picture and written in a pretty difficult word. And, and he's recorded a nice little fragment there of actually something quite interesting about the way in the dry season all the dragonflies come out. And on some of them, I've then added an English translation as well, for anyone who might be interested. Um, so that was, I had this whole idea that it sh shouldn't be too much writing. But what's happened as we've gone along is um, people are actually a lot more interested in the writing than I expected. And even though I wasn't telling them they had to, on almost every page they were making, they were doing some writing. And it was difficult for people, but they, everyone seemed to want to try it. Here's another nice one, maybe. Oh, when the high tide is up, the, the crabs all get brought in on the tide. So there's nice little snippets of knowledge and language. Um, oops. And, uh, but then, if this is the right one, actually it was that one that I just threw away. In a couple of the more recent sessions, so after noticing, oh, I won't be able to show it to you, after noticing that people really did want to have a go at the writing, in a couple of more recent sessions, we actually went back to just do some spelling starting from scratch. So we just started from letters and syllables. Unfortunately, I am no expert in how to teach literacy, but I have the, thanks to the Australian Literacy Foundation, they're trying to help with this. Um, but this was amazingly popular, actually, in the last session. So Margaret was really leading it, and she's an experienced teacher in Wadia, so she knows more about how to do that. And guys, were, they were really keen and participating in a very engaged way with learning how to recognize letters and attach the sound to the letter and then think of words that start with that sound. And people were really getting into it. And I thought that would be a little 15-minute section, but it, that was the whole session, right, for two hours. They, they didn't really want to stop. So that's some of the stuff we've been doing. But another key element, um, so that's probably stuff I all covered, has been about uh, really coming back to some of the stuff about elders and what people can miss out on in prison. And beyond the existing elders visiting program, some other stuff that people can get through a language-based program. So Margaret is going to talk a bit again about some of the traditional knowledge and language stuff. Okay. Teaching traditional knowledge and like in prison, a lot of young prisoners missing things like that, all way of knowledge. 
speaking our language and a lot of young people missing our language like art language in Murimpata. So back home in Wadi, we got seven language groups. The only, the only language that we speak is Murimpata. So in prison there is no hunting. It's really hard for young people in prison. And we talk to them about how really hard for you in prison while your family is going out hunting, your parents teaching young ones going out hunting, looking for bush food, and while you're in prison, it's really hard for you. And this is what they do back home in Wadea, teaching young people going out hunting. When I go to the prison and ask them what you're going to do when you come out from prison, they just tell me, I would like to go out hunting, fishing, and go out to my country. If you go out to your country, you can feel your ancestors' spirit coming through you. That's what they're missing in there, in prison. And I talk a lot about how you're going to do teaching young, young people. Maybe it's, sometimes it's really hard for them when they go home. If they got no car, they're sitting home doing nothing. But you have to stand up on your two feet, do something, teaching the young people. And for myself, I, I speak to the prisoners in there. It's really hard, you know, really, really hard for you coming out of prison, going back home, then coming back here, missing a lot of things, ceremony, cultures, and your kids going to school, good attendance, and now you, you're in prison. Things like that, it's really hard for you. You know, when I see those prisoners, it makes me feel sad inside. Thank you. Okay, so I hope that gives you the general idea of where we're up to. When the third week of the four-week trial program. And uh, just to wrap up, so there's, oh, I don't know if I said it, it's been, yeah, it's been going really well, the trial program. The, they really, um, they enjoy it. And, oh, we had a bit of drop-off over the last week, so maybe I did something not so good in the previous session, I don't know. Um, there was a session there where it was just me, actually, for various reasons, so I think it's, it's, it's clearly better when um, Jeremiah and or Margaret are with me. So we've been trying what works, um, but a challenge is how to evaluate it. So obviously what, what the real game plan, so this is a trial, but we'd love it if this became an established thing. How can that happen? I, I don't know what the roadmap is ahead. Um, a key thing is how to evaluate what we've done. Um, I believe I'll be, we'll be writing some kind of report, which I don't know that's just us saying it was good. I don't know if there's some other way to evaluate it. That's not clear to me. Um, and, but then how can this be made into an established, sustainable thing? Can it be funded? Can it have you know, actual staff having responsibility for it rather than people kind of trying to fit it around what they already do? And maybe like, more like embedding in the culture of NT Corrections where people who work for NT Corrections recognise this and know about it and value it. So that's about it and thanks for your time and we'll be happy for any comments and questions. What's the question just about the iPads, whether you provide them, whether they are only there when they come to the lesson? and whether there was actually training that needed to happen, whether people were familiar with using iPads or not? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, NT Corrections owned the iPads, and they put them in my hands just for the duration of the trial. Um, and yeah, the first session, we were just kind of learning, learning how to use Book Creator. Um, it's nice that it's, a, it's really quite intuitive, user-friendly. Obviously, it still takes a couple of sessions for people to get the hang of it, but it's a really good... Yeah, it's a, it's a good program for this kind of thing. 
Um, mentioning the iPad, there's an interesting amount of, it's another challenge really, uh, technologically, there's a, it's quite a controlled system, the prison system, so that's why we've got these particular specific iPads that have been signed off and have been locked down so that only this app can be used and nothing else. And yeah, and we can't take in any other media and we can't take any pictures and all kinds of stuff. And I would love to show you pictures of the sessions, but we weren't allowed to show you the pictures of the sessions either. So, yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Can I, um, can I ask, Bachelor Institute are doing uh, their foundation skills programs with the literacy and numeracy there? Yeah. Huh. So they start there actually to live thing which is in numeracy in prison. Is yeah. that correct? I don't actually know. I don't know. I said some really vague stuff about other programs in there. I don't actually know much about what the other programs are. I thought there was a whole education system happening. Yeah, yeah that's what I meant by the activity programs. Yeah. There's all these sessions people have. Yeah, there's probably people and there who could deliver this program as part of a project to incorporate and contextualise their literacy and numeracy values. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, if they'd be happy to take on the, the Aboriginal language side of things, then. That could be good, yeah. Um, do you have plans, I don't know that app in particular, but do you have plans of publishing and printing in some way so that they've actually got a tangible? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, the idea has been that we're making this stuff in the sessions and that afterwards we put it together into one ebook. And I, I tried to repeatedly make it clear to them throughout that, that this stuff afterwards, like other people will be looking at it. And we're putting stuff that some other people, it's not exactly well specified who will be able to look at these ebooks. And so don't put anything in there that you don't want people to see in here. Um, also, though, I had more of an idea that we we're going to be making stuff to teach people Murumpata, which we haven't done so much. So I, maybe it would be more appropriate for Murumpata speakers or even Murumpata kids might enjoy some of this material. Yeah. But yeah. That's, that stuff's not totally clear, but it should be getting distributed to some people in Wadia, maybe. Yeah. Uh, John, Hi. that's um, enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Um, just uh, I found the interest in writing on the iPads to be particularly mm. interesting because, you know, as, as you pointed out, literacy in their own language is not something that you take for granted. Um, we were also finding in a different context a bit of surprising surprising to us interest in, in being able to write their own language. Mm. Um, but I wonder in this context whether it's something about the touch screen and the writing on it that it becomes some visible activity within the mm. group that makes it something that people want to do. What do you think about that? I haven't really compared it because this is so new to me. I haven't really it's not like I've ever compared with how people go with writing um, on paper and pencil. But it's definitely a pretty engaging little chunk of metal and glass. Like people pretty much seem happy to spend two hours just engaged with this thing. And yeah, and they show, oh, and they definitely like show each other the things. And uh, I wasn't sure how this would go, but I sometimes ask, that thing you've made, can we all look at that and listen to it now? And people seem pretty happy with that. And sometimes they'll give a little applause afterwards and stuff. So, yeah, that seems to go pretty well. Um, is the content that people are creating, is it completely open-ended? Like, you don't set a theme and they just write whatever they uh, want? Or does someone suggest something? Yeah, no, we've been suggesting things. Um, and I think, I'm, I feel people definitely go better when you give them a suggestion. If given too much, like, do what you want, and people often don't know what to do. Um, so yeah, one idea was we're making stuff to teach people Murumpata, so much they didn't catch on so much. We ended up doing more, um, partly because Margaret was able to join in, which I, I was like a pleasant surprise at one point. So then we tacked more towards um, bush knowledge and animals and seasons and you know, things going on in nature. And that, that took on pretty well. And that's where some of that like old language and old old knowledge stuff comes in, because some of them it was probably even words and vocabulary that they may not use much and may not even know the meanings of. So that stuff has been really good. Um, Piroangi in the Tiwi sessions has also <coughs> been teaching people kind of like older language that they don't don't know that well, and they were really into that. I just sat and watched in some of the Tiwi sessions, and they were they were so into that. 
And then, yeah, in the latter ones, I was trying to find it, but we just started doing spelling. And um, people just spelt words and thought up words for the whole session. And so that, I guess the spelling stuff is not so much content to share, but it's more just like the activity of doing it. Um, I'm just wondering about what opportunities people have while they're in prison for direct communication with their families. Like, I assume they get phone calls sometimes. But, which, that's a sort of a question, but before I... Uh, okay. Before that's a pre-question. I get an answer about oh. that. Yes, yeah, a pre-question. About whether um, there would be a way to extend an element of this you know, both written and recorded literacy into communication with families, you know, as a, another... Yeah. Yeah. Margaret, are you able to answer about how people communicate with their family? I think if they want to contact families, a prisoner is have to ring the family from the prison. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's really hard to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether they could write them letters, you know, yeah. like electronic letters. Uh, the second part of the question, for the, what I know the answer is unfortunately a real no to that. Mm -hmm. um, as part of the content, it's really locked up, things going in and out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of it relating to DVO orders is a big part of that. And so, yeah, we want to take the content out and share it, but that will have to go via some vetting and someone will have to check it to make sure it's not breaching any of that stuff. So, yeah, unfortunately, kind of like, using it as a communication medium, I don't think so go up. So people don't have internet in prison. I didn't actually realise that. I don't know if people know that. I always thought you'd have the internet in prison, but you don't. But now I understand why, kind of. Mm. Because the phone number has to be vetted by the prison before it's allowed to go onto their system. And then they have to have credit to be able to make phone calls. Um, I was just wondering, does the app go onto iPods? Does the prisoners say, like, they can actually buy an iPod in the prison? Really? It's about $500, so not too many of them buy it, but yeah. that's a future option. Yeah, right. Or at least maybe if you could put the ebook on the iPod, or even better if you have that. I, yeah, that would be more likely than actually running the app and being able to create stuff, but if you could put your ebook on there. So some of them do get these iPods? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, thanks for that. Yo. Cool. Had it any other practical difficulties when you try and meet twice a week um, in terms of sometimes people being locked down, not allowed yeah. out, coming late, yeah. information, communication about these people are meant to be there at a certain time, getting mm. through. I've heard that kind of frustration for some other educational programs. I'm just yeah. wondering if that was a factor for you. Yeah, basically. Right. It hasn't been like, hasn't been a disaster, but everything you said has happened at some point. Main thing is like often a bit delayed to start and then there'll be like a couple will come in right on time and then the others could take like up to half an hour so then it's you know do you start or not and then you kind of start it's a little bit yeah yeah. Um, I often yeah I don't, it's obviously a big it's a big complex organization I don't really know much about how it works but I often feel like I just want to know more about what's going on or what to expect yeah. We work in youth justice and we're based in Dongdal at the moment right. and like I worked in community youth justice before that and one thing I noticed like we're, when trying to explain legal stuff like obviously court proceedings can be so confusing for people, like mm. conditions, all that type of thing, um, yeah. especially with like cognitive difficulties and stuff so um, I know like we're trying to develop like a lot of visual resources um, but it'd be really cool, like I'm just, Sorry, I'm not even sure what I'm trying to ask. Like, yeah. It would be cool if there was a way to kind of partnership or contract or pay people mm. um, if they wanted to be developing some of those visual resources. Like, for example, there are some longer term detainees in Dondale who are now like massive mentors to other young people mm. and they kind of make it their task to help role model and show. Like, so yeah. it would just be cool if there was a way, like obviously we could integrate it into youth justice, but also a way to like be paying people for their labour in terms of making all of those processes and stuff in a way that's a lot easier to understand. Yeah. Especially for like English isn't your first language. Yeah. No, I think that's that's a great idea. And there's so existing already there's iPads that are preloaded with for a series of languages. So there's like a Murampata iPad that's preloaded with a bunch of information. And sometimes 
So people have sometimes pointed to that and said, oh, it's already done. But I actually don't think of it in terms of already done. It's great that it's there, but we could do more as well. And there's a benefit not just in having it. There's also a benefit in the act of making it. So um, and for our last, for next week's sessions, what we haven't tried yet, but what I think we might have a go at is doing some sessions where we talk about prison processes and all that and how you say things in Wooden and Yeah, you know. especially like putting them at the centre of it because the way I might perceive things could be different. Like they might have their own little hints and tips to pass on or... Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's, that's a really good idea. Is this available for men and women? Um, the trial at the moment is men, because um, they're just a bigger group, um, and it's easier for me to work with men. Uh, but I know. Yeah, yeah, she's right. Fair. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it'd be great if it could be available for women as well. Has there been, a, have you found a willingness from corrections to um, support this kind of work and a recognition about the value of language and its possibilities? There's been quite a lot of enthusiasm from people in corrections. The Indigenous strategy team or Aboriginal strategy team um, have been, you know, like organising it and pushing the program. Um, as to like up through the hierarchy, I'm just not sure yet. I really want them to grab hold of it and put some will and some weight behind it and give a bit of love to the project and make it a real thing rather than just a one-off trial. But I don't know, I don't know yet if that's going to happen. To get those voices, you talk about evaluation, to get perspective yeah. from that side of things to see if they see the value. Yeah. I've been told the commissioner is passionate about the project. I'd <laughs> love to talk to you maybe afterwards about the connections between academia, corrections, uh, Funding models, and yeah. in terms of how they might, might work together. Um, yeah. I do a bit of work in the women's prison for the women employed program. Mm -hmm. Right. But also, if you don't mind, uh, would like to plug something that's coming up this yeah. week. It's quite relevant. Um, on Sunday is the International Women's Day launch of the Bird's Eye View podcast, mm -hmm. which is the first podcast to come out of a prison in Australia, and it's made in the sector four, which is the women's yeah, right. sector, um, with Joanna Bell and the Sawyer Project. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be available to everyone worldwide. But I think the women in that program and, and in sector four would be really interested in trial mm -hmm. like this or potentially talk to yourself about how that might be rolled out with proper um, mm. um, in that space. Yeah. And so you said there's a launch event on Sunday? Yeah, yeah launch event, Bird's Eye View in the lack I'm not sure oh, if it's a public event, but I'll give you some information. It's a limited, limited guest list. Limited guest um, list. Uh, Sorry, guys, exclusive. No, I've already <laughs> <laughs> But you can get right, the... But, the group, friends, but people friends. can get the podcast anyway, right? Yeah, the podcast is going to be launched on that day. Yeah, I, I did mention that as a part, but I think there's lots of synergies between what you're talking about and yeah. potentially how to yeah. know, going on a longer-term basis. Yeah. Really the funding question is really interesting. I don't... It's not my area I know much about. I did... I got set up to talk with a philanthropic person, like a, a fixer for philanthropy, and she seemed to think it would be like a good thing to get money for, but then when you do something with the government department, can it be philanthropically funded? Can it? I don't know. It can be? Yeah, you, in some ways you kind of want the government to be funding it, but you can do both. Yeah, yeah right. Do you think there'd ever be any scope like down the track to turn this into type of like an accredited training that people could undertake courses in, mm. say like, I don't know, someone like Margaret to undertake a course in it so she can then go in, deliver it, get paid, or even like speech therapists, for example, and then inmates can be accessing that through their NDIS plan if they get treatment under that, like that type of thing. Yeah. So for accredited program, you, do you know about how the bachelor stuff, no. that could be maybe be a bachelor, yeah, that would I think then be kind of bachelor institute territory. And so yeah, this could have been a bachelor program all along in some ways, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why, but anyway, we just did it with the Indigenous um, strategy team. Uh, I used to do a lot of projects in the prison back 15 years ago, mm. um, and we produced books and mm. videos and films, which were award-winning films, mm. but it was all in English, mm. so this is probably a little bit more supportive in that it's in the language. Mm. Yeah. Mm. There used to be plenty of grants.
It's just a four-week. It's a four-week trial, and I don't know what the future of it is. But if you know anyone in NT Corrections and you feel like you have an influence over them, then please uh, okay. say something nice. Ideally, what would you like to see in the future, John? Because I guess, mm. particularly a lot of education, the prison is prisoners on remand don't get a lot of opportunities because they're in and out of prison or in and out of court. So yeah. That they're in there for. Yeah. So a lot of the prisoners that do get into programs have a set sentence, so you know how long they're in there for. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to when you went to whatever, the fellows were in and out of Yeah. It'd be a little bit like that if you tried to work with prisoners on remand. So I was just wondering if you would, would see it just focusing on sentenced prisoners or. Well, we've had a couple of remandees in. Um, I don't know, maybe. I. I don't maybe like short cycles is good in a way. I mean, obviously, then you have the issue of people being at different levels and some being beginners. But I think we're always going to have that anyway because of the lockdown issues and stuff. Some people miss sessions, so you're always having to do a bit of catering to like these guys were here, these guys have just come in, um, and the guys actually do help each other help each other out pretty well for that. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe short cycles will make it available to more people. Does anyone know the existing programs, what kind of cycles they run on? If they're, yeah. And what I would love, I'd love to see this for like men and women, pray like five or six languages, have at least one person working in anti corrections who's a coordinator for it and who's like really dead, giving it some love. The, manage, the hierarchy to know what it's about and respect it and elders. Um, working from the different communities to, to run the sessions with other people if they want, or on their own if they want, whatever works. I pitch my report at the end to Bachelor and see if they take up that support. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When it comes to looking for funding, mm. um, I think all of us here would acknowledge that this kind of program will have a beneficial effect on the, on the whole uh, population in that these people that do this sort of thing get, get to, uh, uh, it improves their own self-image and, mm. and everything. They'll go back to the community and they'll not re-offend so much. Or like less likely to be. So my question is, is there, a, do you have a, a system in place to keep record of who does this course and are they yeah. Yeah. Are likely to re-offend or not? some figures you could put to the authorities and say, look, this is, this is a good thing, it works. Yeah. Because these blokes uh, prove that it works. Yeah, so you, you, yeah, a good target would be recidivism rate. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can try and find out, I guess we can try and find out a couple months down the track <laughs> how many, well then <laughs> it'll be hard, there'll be like, because there'll be some who are still in, there'll be some who are out of the ones who are out how many have stayed out and how does that compare to like the overall mean. Yeah, um, I, I, statistically, it probably won't be, won't be anything. Like the numbers are too small. So I, I think it would probably be more about just doing something descriptive in a report about saying the people engage with it. Perhaps we can get a chance to talk to some people about it later afterwards. Um, but I'm really wary of, like if we do evaluation, I want it to be real. I don't just want to have a if you just have a thing to say it was great, I can just write that anyway. You don't need to do anything for that. Um, I can sit down with people and say, did you think this was good? But we all know people will just say yes. So really, if you can have like real actual objective evaluation, you probably need to have a whole bunch of stuff in place that's not, I don't think, realistic for this. But just, if anything, apart just because of the small numbers. But I don't know if they have real evaluation for their other programs either. Apparently there is some framework, which I haven't found out about yet. Is there still literacy production centres in different parts of the, in, in, in Hotkeys, yeah? 
LP seeker. Yeah. So yeah. even linking with someone like that once they are released and they can use some of those literacy skills and yep. experiences similarly in that same environment. Yeah, you bet. There's two people who've explicitly said, could we go, could we go and try and work at the literacy yeah. production centre when we go no, out? That's that through care that the whole of corrections are trying to get. Yeah. And that's long term mm -hmm. supposed to reduce the sentence. It's yeah. easier said than done. So. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think if we don't want to evaluate, we can maybe just look at case studies or something of individual yeah. people. Maybe we can try and catch up with people who have got out a few months down the track. And, yeah. So please join me in thanking our presenters for today.